re really happy to host you here um, today. I just tell you a bit about the Institute and then I'll leave you to your own business. Um, the Institute was founded in 1975 and it's actually the third Institute for Advanced Studies in the world after the Princeton one, which served as the model for all the Institutes for Advanced Studies and the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies who was founded in 71. So um, we are one of the pioneers. And the institute was founded by the Hebrew University and Yad Nadiv in order to uh, promote connections between Israeli academia and scholars from all around the world. Um, and ever since, we have hosted more than 2,000 fellows and I think something like 150 research groups of scholars who come over to the institute for a period between five to 10 months and stay here as a safe haven to do their own work without the burden of administration and um, teaching. Um, we also host six advanced school for, for PhD students from all over the world and uh, these are in various uh, um, fields. And as you all know, um, we have a soft spot for mathematics. Uh, we host here the Midosha Mathematica every year. And uh, we hosted several uh, research groups in mathematics. And I think that we have one coming in February dealing with mathematical models for agriculture. So, um, we're very happy, we were very happy that when Anir came over and asked us to host this uh, uh, conference. And all I have to do is to wish you a very fruitful and enjoyable uh, gathering. So thank you very much, thanks for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to open this um, um, conference symposium um, um, in honor of um, um, Shimshon Abraham Amitzur um, um, and to celebrate uh, hundred, his 100th birthday. Um, 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 well, you all know that um, Amitzur was one of the greatest algebraists of the 20th century. He was involved in so many revolutions and new concepts and new theories. Um, and um, yeah, I was. I was lucky to have him as a scientific father and a grandfather. <laughs> and um, um, I'm also very grateful to the Institute for Advanced Studies um, uh, for hosting us here and, uh, and, and, and to the whole scientific uh, committee. So uh, it's um, Avino Aman, uh, Louis Rohan, David Saltman, uh, Len Small, Uzi Vishne, and uh, myself. This is uh, the only uh, on-site um, uh, day. Uh, other days will be um, online, but this is hybrid, so it's only it's also online. Okay, I shouldn't uh, uh, speak um, much. I'm, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker today. Uh, um, you have Segev from Ben Gurion uh, um, University, and he will uh, talk about a characterization of the quaternions using commutators. Okay, uh, thank you, Anair, and I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to be here today. Um, right, and, uh, so let me start. Uh, so as Anair, Recording in progress. Uh, live on the, uh, 
jcans and so on. And then you're only left with squares of i, square of j, square, square of k. And this, this also says that the square of k, from this and this, it follows that the square of k is also in I'm sorry to disrupt one moment. They can't hear you at Zoom. I'm sorry? They can't hear you on Zoom. Can you work with the microphone? This or this, whatever's convenient this. for you. Okay, so I guess now you can hear me on Zoom. And so I said what is written on the board. This is one of the reasons that I write most of the things on the board, so that if somebody is, uh, doesn't hear, for example, or for any other, other reason, there's an echo. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, the s what I've said up till now is written here on the board. And so the square of a pure quaternion is in the field. So this is one property of the quaternions. And also, for any two elements uh, in a quaternion algebra, the commutator That's the, that's the commutator of x and y. This thing is a pure quaternion. It's a, it's a, it's a pure quaternion because, uh, because, you know, the field thing, you know, let's say that, that one starts with alpha and that one starts with beta. You get alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha, and that thing cancels. And you're left only with i, j, and k. A linear combination of i, j, and k. And the theorem that I would like to present and prove today is that this characterizes the quaternion algebras. So the, the only theorem that I will discuss today and prove is the following theorem. So let R be, and I'm writing it here in order to expose it from time to time. So let, let R be an associative ring, an associative ring with one having a, an identity element, a, a unit element, whatever you call it, uh, with one which is not commutative. Which is not commutative. And assume, uh, so the first assumption is that uh, commutators are not zero divisors. A, a non-zero commutator in R is not is not a zero divisor. And the second assumption is that the square of commutators are in the center for elements x, y in R the square of the commutator x and y is in C, where C is the center of R. Okay, those two assumptions give you quaternions. So they have this property and it characterizes them. So then uh, one uh, R has no di has no zero divisors. And two, uh, if the characteristic uh, of uh, of R, yeah, it has no zero divisors, so it it has a characteristic. If it is not two, then uh, the localization. Localization of R at, it, at its center is a quaternion division division algebra. Okay, so that's the theorem. 
Um, that's it. That's the theorem I want to prove today. Um, okay, let, let me continue over there before I cover the theorem. Um, I want to I want to give two remarks. Uh, one 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 is uh, one is about what is a zero divisor. So two elements for x y in R non-zero. If x y is zero, then both x and y are zero divisors. Okay, so these are zero divisors. And, uh, and uh, uh, another remark is that note that there is no finite dimensionality assumption in the theorem. It comes out of, 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 the, of those hypotheses, but they're not inside there. Um, right. Right, so uh, let me start by proving the theorem. Uh, so the, the first part that I want to show is that that this, this fact that commutators are not, are not zero divisors is already sufficient, plus, plus the other fact, is sufficient to show that R has no zero divisors. So, lemma one. Let C be in the center, uh, which, uh, which is not zero. Take a non-zero element in the center, then it is not a zero divisor. So central elements are not zero divisors. Proof. Let uh, uh, let x y be a non-zero commutator. Take a non-zero commutator, which exists because R is not commutative. Uh, and suppose C times some element is zero, where R is not zero. Okay, I'll show that R is zero, whatever. Uh, suppose that C, t C times R is zero, uh, then X, Y, C times R times R is equal to, is uh, okay, X, Y, C times R equals x, y, c times r, we are in an in associative ring, and this is zero. But this product equals this. And it is non-zero because x, y, because commutators are not zero divisors. Right? So, so we get a commutator times r equals zero, this is a commutator times r, which is equal, which is zero. So this implies that r is zero. So this proves lemma one that commutators cannot be zero divisors. Right. Um, okay. Now I'll show that uh, that elements which are not commutators, uh, uh, which are sorry, that. Uh, Central elements are not zero divisors, and I'll uh, show that uh, non-central elements are also not zero divisors. Okay? So this is lemma two. Uh, so take an element X, which is in, in R, but not in uh, the center, C, uh, and let, and take a commutator Uh, which is not zero. Then, uh, then one, v and v plus v x. Sorry, v x. V x and v plus v x are both commutators. Are both non-zero commutators. Uh, or two says that this uh, this x satisfies a quadratic equation over over the center. So a x squared plus b x plus c zero. For 
over some ABC in the center with A not zero and C not zero. Three X X is not a zero divisor. Four R has no zero divisor. Of course, uh, uh, four follows from three because I've, sh I've seen, th I've shown that central elements are not zero divisors, and this shows, uh, this shows that non-central elements are not also not zero divisors. So three is so four fo follows from three. Um, okay, let, let me start with one. Okay, let's see where do I write the proof of one? Let's see, maybe here. Right, so proof. Proof one uh, Vx equals xyx equals xyx. This is a very easy computation that xy times x is a, actually you can put the x inside. Um, um, well, maybe I have the time to show that. So. So what is so what is x y x x y x is x y x minus y x x and this is equal to um, uh, x y minus y x times x which is x y x okay right so uh, so uh, v x is a, is a commutator and it's not zero because x y is not a zero divisor and x is not zero. I hope I wrote that. Uh, yeah, x is in R minus. So this is an, a non-zero commutator and also uh, also v plus v x equals v times one. We have identity in the in the ring. So this is v times one uh, plus x and uh, this is x y times 1 plus x, and uh, this is x, y times 1 plus x. And again, uh, this is not zero for, for the same reason, because v times x, 1 plus x cannot be zero. The commutator times 1 plus x cannot be zero. Right, so, so this shows that these two guys are commutators. So by, by uh, the second hypothesis of the theorem, their square is is non, a non-zero element, a non-zero element in the center. So now let alpha be equal to v plus v x squared. This is v squared plus this equals v squared plus v squared x plus v x v plus v x squared. Right. Uh, multiplying this identity, alpha is in the center. It's in the center because it's a square of a commutator. Multiplying this by x, we get that alpha x equals v squared x plus v squared x squared plus v x squared plus v x squared x. Okay. Uh, this this equals uh, v squared times x squared plus um, v squared v squared uh, let's see pl plus v squared plus v x squared times x uh, plus v x squared right. Right? Okay. Uh, now, if I'm moving this to that side, uh, then this, this becomes zero, and I can write here minus alpha, minus alpha here, 
and this is A, which is non-zero, this is C, which is non-zero, and this is B. So I have a, a quadratic equation satisfied by X. All right? Right, so this shows part two of the lemma. Um, right, uh, okay, so, uh, so I'll, I'll now prove part three. So, so okay. So this covers. Uh, okay. So, so part three of the lemma says that uh, I hope you can see that it says that x is not a zero divisor. So here's the proof of part three of lemma two. Uh, well, I want to show that x is not a zero divisor, but I know it satisfies a quadratic equation. So suppose x suppose x times some r is zero, and then multiply this this equality by r. Multiply the whole equality by r, you get that this time r is zero. You get zero from here. You get zero from here. And then you get c times r equals 0. So you get the c times r is 0, but c is a central, not 0, central elements. And we've seen that central elements are not 0 divisor. So this implies, uh, this implies that r is 0, because this one is non-zero central element. So this uh, shows part 3, and four, uh, 4 follows follows from 3 and lemma 1. Okay, so I've shown that, uh, uh, I've shown the first part of the theorem, which says that under these conditions, R has now zero divisors. Right, now I have to show, uh, uh, now I want to show part 2 of the theorem. Okay, so so uh, 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 so since uh, since R has, I hope one can see this green. Oh, the blues are running out. But anyway, since since R uh, has no zero divisors. Uh, one can one can do the localization of R at at center, namely put all the elements of the non put all the non-zero. You can throw it. Uh, put, put all uh, thanks all uh, uh, non-zero elements. Put all non-zero elements uh, of of uh, of the center. Put them uh, uh, on the on the de on the de uh, denominator. Yeah. So you can divide by by central elements, and then you get the fra you, you get the center as the fraction field of the center of R, and so and, and since R has no zero divisors, uh, then uh, then putting then putting uh, elements of the C of the center C in the in the denominator. Denominator. Uh, one can assume. <coughs> one can assume that C is a field. Yeah, you get the center as the fraction field of the center of R. You get the uh, and everything else doesn't change. So from now from now on, <coughs> I'm assuming that C is. Uh, the field, and I'm assuming that uh, uh, so we uh, so we can assume we can assume that C is a field, and we also assume as as in two of the as in two of uh, the uh, theorem as in part two that the characteristic of R is not two. 
right. Um, right. So now I, I'm I'm pr I'm going to identify. Uh, my, my next step is, excuse me, uh, is to identify uh, a quaternion algebra inside our ring R, and the fourth and last step would be to show that this is the whole uh, the whole algebra. So let's let's first identify a quaternion quaternion algebra inside the ring R. And this is lemma three. Uh, so we take uh, uh, so we take let okay I'll write it like that. There exists I a commutator I in R minus C. Any the i of the of the the i of the quaternion algebra can be any commutator which is not in the center, and I claim that there e exists one one at least. This would be the i of the of the quaternion of the forthcoming quaternion algebra, um, and uh, so th th maybe that's part one. Part two. Uh, part two. Let J be I S uh, non zero. Take uh, take a non zero commutator of I, which exists because I is not in the center. Um, uh, then I J uh, equals minus J I. And three C plus C I let's call it Q plus C J plus C K uh, plus C K uh, well let's call it Q is a quaternion division algebra okay so so this identifies a quaternion division algebra inside the inside our ring proof uh, let I didn't define K. K is IJ. Thank you. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so, take it to a commutator. I have a commutator which is non-zero. I don't know that it's not in the center. If it is in the center. Uh, uh, well, x is not in the center because otherwise this would not be non-zero. So if this is in the center, then this commutator is not in the center. Okay, so either x y or x y x are not in the center. So I've, I've found one commutator which is not in the center. This is my i. Uh, this is part. This is part one. Part two. Uh, I j equals i times, and what is j? J is i s minus s i. Okay, this is equal to i squared times s plus i s i. Right. This is equal to s i squared. Recall i squared is in the center. I i is a commutator. Square of commutators are in the center, so I can move the the i square on the other side, plus i s i. I'm sorry. Oh, minus. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right now, now this is this is equal to s i minus i s times i. But this is minus j. This thing is minus g. Right, and three follows from two. From two. So I've, I've identified a, a quaternion division algebra 
uh, inside. Why is it a division? Is it a division algebra and not a matrix uh, ring? Because we have no zero divisors in the field, so it cannot be a matrix ring. So it is a quaternion division division algebra. So I am left. Uh, uh, so what what is left is to show that this is the whole ring. Uh, let's do it. Let's do it on this board. And this is the uh, this is the sort of more everything is elementary and, 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 and straightforward, but uh, in some sense. But uh, this one is a slightly more it has it has, it has slightly more complicated uh, argument, so I'll call it a proposition. Uh, this is the last proposition, and and it will show that R that uh, that uh, this 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 thing Q. Is the whole uh, is the whole ring? So, proposition for part one. Part one says the following: uh, Let uh, let p be an element which is not in the center, and assume that p u plus u p, which I call d u is in the center. Assume that this holds uh, for all u in ijk. Okay? Assume that this holds. Then p must be in q. Who is q? q is this guy, yeah? Such an element must be in q. And uh, part two says that uh, if I take an x, uh, okay, if I take an x which is in R, but uh, if if there is an x, if there is some x in R minus q, uh, yeah, okay, okay. I, I'm used to call this guy p. Okay, so. So those are two different p's. If there is an element p in R minus minus q, then uh, um, okay. Let x take an x. Uh, suppose there is an x in R minus q. Then there exists an element p in R minus q satisfying. Well, let's call it star, where star is this identity. Okay. So, so this, this thi these two things cannot uh, live together unless uh, R is Q. Right. Okay. So I have to prove to you. Uh, uh, so I have to prove to you. Oh, this is uh, this is white. Okay, so I have to I have to prove to you uh, part one. So let's start with part one. Um, right. So let M be equal to the following uh, um, uh, following element. Well. M equals P U plus U P. Um, okay, M is equal to uh, let, let let M be equal to P I plus I P plus um, D I over I squared times I plus D J over J squared times J plus um, plus uh, dk over k squared times k. In fact, I can write here pu plus up, where u is in ijk. Okay, 
And I want to show uh, that uh, um, mi plus im is equal to 0. Uh, I'll show mi plus mi mi plus im is equal to 0. And this, this will, this will uh, be the same for j and k. I'll show it for i. Same argument works for j and k. So for i, so in this case, so m, uh, 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 let's see. So, so, so I'll show that, f that um, I'll show that mu, um, let's see. So, right, so, let's see. Um, just a second. Let's see what's going on here. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That means P. I'm sorry. That means P minus this, minus this, and minus this. Okay? So I want to show that M M M U plus U M is zero for all U. Okay? Right, so uh, so 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 let's check it so uh, let us let us check it. for um, u equals i, OK? So for u equals i, mi plus im equals pi plus ip um, minus, when I multiply this by i on the left and then by i on the right, this is a central element. pi is central, i squared is central. So when I multiply this by i on the left and then by i or by i on the right, and then by i on the left, I get di, right? Now, multiplying this by i on the left, and then by i on the right, get, you get 0, because you get ij plus ji. And here you get ik plus ki. So you get plus 0 plus 0. Now, but this is di, right? So, so you get that this is 0. And uh, exactly the same argument works for, for J and, and, and for, for K. So this identity holds uh, for all the U's. OK. And now, and now uh, so, we, so we get MI equals minus IM, MJ equals minus JM, and MIJ now equals to what? It equals to I can I can switch the uh, the i and the j and I get um, uh, uh, okay and and I switch the i and the j and I get minus i m j and I switch again the j and the m and I get minus uh, minus and I get plus and I get plus i j m so this is mk equals km. So you get that mk equals km if, if, if those two things uh, hold. But however, mk is minus m. However, we've seen that mk equals minus km. So since the characteristic is not 2, so, so, so this f it, it, it implies that two m k is equal to zero. Uh, uh, okay, two m k is equal to zero. Uh, so m k is zero. And since k uh, and and since we have no zero divisors, this implies that m is zero. So m is zero. So we see that p is a linear combination of i j and k. We see that p is in the uh, P is in Q. So P is in Q. 
and uh, and uh, it remains to show that uh, uh, it remains to show. Uh, that uh, that uh, uh, if there is an element outside of Q, then there is an ele element P satisfying star here. So so part three, um, uh, let x squared minus uh, b x plus c equals zero uh, equals zero. So we have a quadratic equation. Uh, we know that x satisfies the quadratic equation, and so it satisfies the monic quadratic equation. Uh, let p be equal to x minus b half. So this means that p squared is in c. Now p plus u, take a u, it equals to c1, p plus u, plus c2, because P plus u satisfies the quadratic equation. P minus u squared equals C, C3, C3 P plus u plus C4, because P plus u satisfies the quadratic equation. Adding the two sides, we get P squared, 2P squared plus 2U squared, uh, P squared plus 2U squared equals, uh, this is minus u. Right, equals um, it, it 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 equals C one plus C three P plus C one minus C three U plus C two plus C four. Right now, this is an element in the field, in the center, and this is this this is this all this is in the center. Now, since P P is not in Q, this must be zero. Because if you move this to this side, you would get, if this is non-zero, you would get that P is in Q. So, so P is not in Q implies C plus C3 equals zero. So this is gone. Now this, since U is not in the center, U is not in the center, U is one of I, J, K. And since U is not in the center, C1 minus C3 must be 0. So C1 equals C3 equals 0. Now going back to this equation, going back to this equation, we get P squared, we get P squared uh, plus 2 PU. Um, all right, we get P squared plus 2 PU. Uh, plus u squared um, uh, plus plus u squared uh, equals c two. Um, right. So right. So two p u equals um, C2 minus P squared minus U squared. This is in the center because P squared is in the center and U squared is in the center. And so, and so multiply by, multiply this identity by U, we get that P, this implies that P is in Q. Yeah, by multiplying this identity by U, uh, you get that 2p is this ti this thing times u. Um, right, so this implies that p is in q, and so um, so this is a contradiction, and of course three follows from four. Right, I'm done. Okay. So I would like to correct something that was right at the uh, mistake that was right at the end of my talk. Of course, it's not in the paper, but in the in the article, but it it was on the board. So I proved this proposition, proposition four, and right towards the end of my talk, I reached the point where I got p plus u squared equals c 
two. This was the end of my uh, uh, the, uh, right at the end. And so from this it follows that p squared plus p u plus u p plus u squared equals c two. So it follows it follows that p u plus u p equals c two minus p squared minus u squared. Now all those, this one is in the center, this one is in the center because it was chosen this way, and this one is in the center. So we have that this sum is in the center, and th this is for all u in i, j, and k. And so it follows that if there is an element outside of q in r, then there is an element outside of outside of Q in R that satisfies star, which is the which we, which was the goal of part two. That's it. So th that's the correction. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yor, uh, very much. Um, I, I'm we, we'll have to defer questions to the um, um, coffee coffee break, um, I guess. And uh, the, next, uh, the next speaker is Eliyahu Matsri from Bailan University, and he will tell us about uh, the symbol length of symbols in Galois cohomology. Again, I'd like to thank the, the organizers for allowing me to give a talk in this wonderful conference. At least part of it is live, so <laughs> it's nice. We're halfway there, but hopefully next one will be fully live. Um, yeah. The next centennial, exactly. Because Corona is here to stay. What can we do? Um, I will try to make the talk as brief as possible. So we will have some coffee time, hopefully. Um, so the talk is about symbol length of symbols, basically. I'd like to start uh, by giving the, like putting things in perspective of the bloch cato conjecture. So I'll just give a few words on what is that conjecture and what are the objects in play. So given a field F, <coughs> you can attach two kinds of objects. The first thing you can do is you can define the usual cohomology groups coming from the absolute Galois group of our field. So we can define the H and F. I'm going to use finite coefficients. So I'll say what is mu m, for example. So this is just H and GF mu m. So mu m well, before mu m. Let's say that GF is the Galois group of the separable closure of F, also known as the absolute Galois group of the field. And um, UM is the Galois module of roots of unity. This is a non-construction. I'm not going to elaborate on that. What's nice about these kinds of objects is that they come automatically with exact sequences and very nice properties. 
that you can use. But we have no real presentation in terms of generators and relations. Um, the other kind of uh, objects, well, before I go there, let's talk about some specific objects that we, we have here. So if you take H1, F mu M, this is just F modulo M powers. So I can write an element here as just an element of the field. I'm going to do that. So for example, A belongs to H1. But in cohomology, we have the notion of cup products. So whenever we have this kind of thing, so suppose I have A1 and A2 here, then I can cup them to get something called A1 cup A2. It will now be in H2, F mu M tensor 2. And this is like a two-dimensional si symbol. So in Hn, along these lines, you can define A1 cup An inside Hn, S mu M tensored N. And these elements are what we call symbols. Okay, these are symbols. So in some sense, these are like the, the easiest objects we can get coming from H1, which we supposedly understand. It's just the field modulo m's powers and just copying using this operation. That's a very nice thing. Uh, maybe I can relate it to the previous talk now because quaternions are a specific case of symbols and Well, I'll do it in a second. Let's talk about the other object, which is the Milner K theory. So the second things are So what is that? Well, I'll define it for any n. The Kn group of F. I'm going to do it like in a relaxed way. It's generated by symbols. This is the origin of the word symbols because these are like just symbols. Um, I think traditionally they're denoted like this in these kind of curly brackets. And so any eyes of F star modulo some relations saying that um, it's additive in every entry. So if you have um, A, B times, I don't know, A2 up to A, N, it's the same as A, A2 up to A, N plus B, A1, A2 up to A, N. This is the first thing. And in every entry, we have this. And things of the form, say, a times 1 minus a are also trivial. Okay. Of course, a cannot be 1. And this gives you a group which is very nicely presented by generators and some relations. But it lacks the exact sequences and other functorial properties that we have for cohomology. Um, the real groups we are interested in are the sort of Kn, I'll write it Knm, like this maybe, which is just the Kn modulo m. I'm going to create torsion in these groups. And the bloch cato conjecture basically says that we should expect this thing and this thing to be isomorphic. Okay? I'm going to say what the map is. 
So the bloch got to map, I'll call it. taking a symbol into the symbol. So if you have like A1 to AN, it's sent to A1 cup AN. Okay? So this is also known as the norm residue homomorphism, but I'll just call it the bloch cato map. And it was a conjecture, and recently uh, mathematically recently. It was solved completely by Rost with contribution, uh, by Wojewodski, sorry, with comp contribution by, from Rost. But the case of um, N and M equals 2 is a theorem of Mercurier. And the general case of N equals 2 is Mercurier and Suslin. And just to connect it to other names you might have heard, the case of M equals 2 is also known as the Milner conjecture. Oh, Milner conjecture. This was also, this was proved by Wojewodski. And the general case, as I said, is a celebrated theorem of Wojewodski with, I'll say, I think major contribution, but let's say contribution from Rost. <coughs> so let's talk about this ex at least for a second. Um, What happens when n equals 2? And for simplicity, I'm going to assume now that roots of unity are always in my base field. I don't want to write this twist all the time. I'm just going to write mu m every time. So um, mu m is contained in f for us. And let's take the case of n equals 2. Then we have this known isomorphism that, um, well, h2 f mu m is actually the m torsion part of the bra group of your base field. So the case of n equals 2 says that k2 modulo m is isomorphic to the m torsion part of the bra group. In particular, every ele element should be expressible as a sum of symbols. And in this case, symbols have nice presentation, uh, a nice meaning. They're not just symbols, they're actually what's called symbol algebras or more generally cyclic algebras when you don't have roots of unity. But what are symbols? So the symbol A, B, for example, is being sent to what we call the symbol algebra A, B, M, F, which is uh, the field F adjoint with two indeterminants X and Y subjugated to the relations um, x to the, to the m equals a, y to the m equals b, and yx is rho m xy, where rho m is a primitive m roots of unity. And in this language, the quaternion that we talked about before are just the symbol minus 1, minus 1, 2f. 
So this is what we know as quaternion algebras that were talked about before. So in this case, for example, if you have an algebra in the bar group who has exponent 2, the theorem guarantees that you can write it as a tensor product of quaternion algebras in the Brar group. Namely, if you add enough matrices to your algebra, you get a product of quaternion algebras. So most of the research, I would say, was concentrated on the case of n equals 2. There are a lot of nice results. My favorite is the result of Albert that an algebra of degree 4 and, in the, and the exponent 2 is actually isomorphic to the sum of two uh, quaternions. It's a very nice result, I think. Of course, Albert Brauer as an author is also a highlight in that regard, saying that over global and local fields, everything is cyclic, every algebra is cyclic. So the symbol, everything is one symbol. And what I'm getting at is that there is a question here. If you're given an element, whether it's an algebra or in H3, H4, whatever, you know you can write it as a sum of symbols. But how many symbols do you need? That's the symbol length question. So the symbol length is given alpha in Hn. So notice now that all of these twists vanish because I assume roots of unity are inside. So the tensor product of um with itself is again um. So I don't need to write all of these things. Um, given alpha here, how many symbols? a general thing and well for H2 as I said there are quite a few results by now um, for H3 and above there are almost no no results known there are no, I'm gonna write down one of the major results that I know about which is by uh, Suresh and Parimala I think um, but beyond that, I'm really, well, there is something that Serre did if the cohomological dimension is at most n, then in Hn minus 1, with mu2 coefficient, everything is one symbol. But clearly, these are not general kind of results. It's like what one thing or two. Here is the result of um, Parimala and Suresh. If f is a function field, of a curve over a periodic field. So over a periodic field is the Parimala and Suresh. Or a number field. I think this one is by Suresh alone in a different one, then every element in H3, F mu P now, P is a prime is one symbol. This is a very nice result. Um, and there is a preprint by Saurab sitting here that he eliminates the need for B to be, P to be a prime, and he will not require F to contain the roots of unity. So he's generalizing this result, which is quite impressive. But basically, that's what I know. Once on this question, 
when it comes to higher cohomology ring uh, groups, higher than two. So high for us is three, I guess. I mean, two is very challenging on its own, but I think at least with H2, we have algebras to work with. In H3, I really don't know what to do. Um, okay, so here is like a, a nice little sketch that I like to have in mind. So we have um, Hn p to the m minus 1 going to Hn mu p to the n going to Hn mu p. Um, here, it's the, it's these maps are induced from the um, exact sequence. One goes to this group, to this group, to this group, to one. It induces, like I said, exact sequences. This is a part of a long exact sequence. Um, and here, the operation is to raise the coefficient to the power p, if I write it, p to the n minus one. Just thinking of your root of unity, you raise it to the p to the n minus one power, it becomes a piece root of unity, and then you get an element here. Okay? Above this, we have the k groups. I have k n p to the m minus one goes to k n p to the n goes to k n p. And here are the isomorphisms that we have. And the main question I'm asking is, suppose you have an element here, let's call it alpha, and when you raise it to the p to the n minus 1 power, you land here, it becomes 0. Alpha goes to 0 here. It means that it comes from this guy. So there is some alpha prime or alpha tilde that goes here. But this group is isomorphic to this one. So this alpha prime is a sum of symbols of this degree shifted here. So what I want to know is how many do I need him of them to express alpha? Okay, so this is a different way to ask the same question. But what I'm interested in is something manageable. So I'm going to take alpha to be a symbol. Okay, I'm not going to take a general cohomology class because I have no idea how they look. But if I take alpha a symbol, then I'm able to say something. Yes, exactly. So it's not exactly exponent p to the n minus 1. It's like exponent in this group. You, you have to look at it here. But when, since I assume all roots of unity are in my base field, you can really say the word exponent, because these are embeddings here. So it's like you're working in this group, and you have this group as a subgroup, and this one as a subgroup, and everything is OK. OK, so <coughs> of course. I'm not the first one to ask this question. It's kind of natural to start with when you want to tackle such a big question. You start with some basic uh, cases. And indeed, Tignol did something about this kind of thing. Uh, there is a result by Tignol. Stating, and I'm not going to say it in its full generality, just in our case. So if I have a symbol in H2, so if alpha in H2 is a symbol of degree p to the n, so it means like it lives in this group, and exponent p to the m that is, when you raise it to the p to the mth power, not n minus 1, it lands in this group and is 0, then alpha is a sum of, at most, p to the n minus m symbols of degree p to the m namely coming from this group. Okay? 
this is a very nice result, and the proof is actually quite, uh, I wouldn't say simple, but it's very nice. Um, and I was very intrigued by this result, and I thought I can generalize it in some cases. So here is my results, so new results, inspired by this theorem. So first thing I can do is I can reprove this <laughs> in the case where we don't have roots of unity in the base field. So reprove, uh, I would say it's, it's like this, because when you don't have roots of unity, his theorem is not valid. But I work with K theory, so you can make a statement there. So it's reproving Tignol's theorem in the context of K theory in K2. But this is, the second thing is that in H3, I'm going to do like if, what did I say? Let's, so if alpha is a symbol, in H3 to the N, uh, of exponent dividing P, okay, such that P to the N minus one times alpha is zero. So the exponent divides P to the N minus one. Um, where am I? Not N, it's, yeah, it's N, it's okay. Then it's the sum of it most at most p squared symbols of degree p to the n minus 1. Okay, so if you, if you compare it to the h2 case, here it will be p symbols. In h3 it becomes p squared symbols. And the last, uh, well, So maybe I'll just write it here. What time is it? Oh, I have like 10 minutes. OK. Yeah, but what about higher cohomology groups? Like what about H4 and so on? So this is going to be 2, 3. So if F is characteristic zero and P special, namely um, it's a field which has no prime to P field extensions. Okay, every polynomial of degree prime to P has a root in your field. You can achieve it by taking like the, uh, the separable closure and the invariant part by some P silo subgroup. It will be a P special field. Um, then every symbol alpha in H and um, U P to the M of exponent. P to the n mi m minus 1, or dividing P to the n minus 1, is a sum of at most in Hn, so it's P to the n minus 1 symbols of degree minus 1. So it's like the, the cohomology degree minus 1 p raised to that number. Okay, it's so obviously you can see induction in the proof here. That's just like how it goes. Um, the next one is that, well, 
Here I have to have f of characteristic 0 and p special because the machinery I'm using is the machinery of norm varieties, which was the contribution of Rost to the block cutter conjecture, and they're only defined in this situation. Um, but for um, mu2 coefficients, when p is 2, we have Pfister forms serving as norm varieties, and they are defined over any field of characteristic not 2 at least. So this is the last one. So if P is 2, then and characteristic of F is not 2, then 3 is true as well, without the requirements of uh, P special or characteristic zero. And so the basic, basic idea for these uh, results is basically computing the symbol. Um, namely, what you really need to know is what does it mean for a symbol to be zero? That's the most, the hardest part in understanding a symbol. And if you raise it to the p to the n minus 1 power, you land with something with mu p coefficients. And in this case, we have Mercury of Suslin varieties, telling us exactly when a symbol in with mu p coefficient is trivial. So Mercury of Suslin varieties say that a, b, c is trivial if and only if c is a norm from the algebra a, b of some kind of element. Let's call it uh, c, whatever, d. So you need to have something c as a norm. And what I did, basically, was to compute the norm of an element, of a general element in a cyclic algebra using twisted polynomial rings and came up with the result. Uh, for the reproving thing, I used severi Brau varieties, which are much more uh, known. For these, like I said, uh, I used uh, norm varieties, a specific uh, birational expression of the norm varieties, given in Chuck Weibel's uh, book. And for these guys, I just used the theory of Pfister forms. And it's very smooth. It's like an exercise after you learn about Pfister forms. It's quite amazing that nobody did it until now, but that's math, so that's it. Thank you. We, we have time for uh, one or two questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so it's a pleasure to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Adam Chapman from uh, the Academic College um, of Yafo. The title is uh, The Essential Dimension of a Sentence of Two Central Simple Algebras in the Bad Characteristic Case. <laughs> אבל אני צריך להחזיק את זה. for inviting us and for everybody to show up here. So I'm going to talk about the 
essential dimension of central simple algebras in the bad characteristic. And I need to explain a few things. I'm also grateful to Ellie for introducing many terms that I'm going to use. And now I can assume that you all know them. Um, OK, so let's start with the idea of the essential dimension. So you ca in the background, throughout the talk, I'm going to assume that this little k is an algebraically closed field. And everything is going to take is going to take place over that thing. Okay, you can think about the complex numbers or whatever you want. So you have some covariant functor from fields over that little k. So they all contain this little k. as a subfield, two sets. When you have such a functor and you take an object A defined over some field F, so I didn't specify the functor yet, but you can think about quadratic forms of a prescribed dimension or central simple algebras of a prescribed degree, whatever. So this thing lives over a field. It may happen that there's a smaller field E, both containing little k and an object defined over this E, such that A is actually the scalar, sc scalar extension of this object to F. This may happen. And now how do we define the essential dimension of A? The essential dimension of A is the minimal transcendence degree of such an E to which this A descends over this little k. Okay, that's the essential dimension of A. And the essential dimension of the functor itself is the supremum on the essential dimensions of all these objects ranging over all the fields F and all the um, elements in the category here. So that's the idea of the essential dimension. Now there's also the essential P dimension that I might mention later. For the essential P dimension, before you extend, before you descend to E, you can extend scalars to any prime to, fee, to P extension of this field F. So now, we are talking about central simple algebras. And the functor I'm going to focus on is this. So I denote it by alg with subscript p to the n comma p. Well, this thing means the set of isomorphism classes of all central simple algebras over f of degree p to the n and exponent p. Well, p is a prime. Okay, so p is a prime. One can talk more generally about algebras of prescribed degree and exponent, but that's complicated enough for our discussion. So let's focus on that. And we want to know what the essential dimension of this thing is. <coughs> and the bottom line is that it's pretty complicated. Okay, so what I'm going to say is that it's pretty complicated, and the main result I'm aiming at is the following. So when the characteristic of this little k is p, the essential dimension of this guy is greater or equal to n plus 1. Well, I forgot to mention that this work is joint with Kelly McKinney. Now, I just record that because I'm going to cite her work before I'm citing ours. Um, there are two ways that I know to prove this theorem. One way is what Kelly did four years ago. So McKinney, in 2017, proved that the essential dimension of the generic tensor product 
of cyclic algebras, and I'm going to explain everything in a few seconds. Uh, the generic tensor product of cyclic algebras of degree p is exactly n plus 1. And therefore, the essential dimension of this functor is at least n plus 1. And what we did together more recently, like during the corona times, is to prove that the essential dimension of an indecomposable algebra of degree p to the n and exponent p is greater or equal to n plus 1. And since indecomposables, indecomposable algebras of that type exist, this also implies the theorem. And surprisingly, this is much easier than that. We'll see why. But now, before I get to the proof, I want to explain why this theory is difficult and why it's not so easy to compute the essential dimension of these objects. So let's start with the easiest case. We just talk about algebras of degree p and exponent p. Okay. Now, you do have a specific type of algebras called cyclic algebras that Ellie mentioned. So cyclic algebras of degree p, how do they look like? So when the characteristic of k is different from p, now I don't need to assume the existence of roots of unity because this little k is algebraically closed. Okay. So they are there automatically. In this case, any cyclic algebra can be denoted by the Hilbert symbol alpha comma beta. And that stands for the algebra generated over f by some x and y such that x to the p is alpha, y to the p is beta, and yx is rho xy, where well this rho is a primitive pth root of unity. Now, when the characteristic is bad, and it's obvious now what bad means, um, you have a cyclic algebra of this type. So we are denoting it by this asymmetric symbol. And they have different roles. So it's still generated by x and y, but now <coughs> x to the p minus x is alpha, y to the p is beta, but y x y inverse is x plus 1. Okay, It's a different kind of algebra still of degree p, still either a division algebra or a matrix algebra. Now, when you just consider cyclic algebras, it's quite clear what the essential dimension is, because you can always descend to a field E, which is actually little k to which you adjoin alpha and beta. Right? So the essential dimension is at most 2. On the other hand, this little k is algebraically closed. If you, are over, if you live of, over a field of transcendence degree 1 or 0 over little k, this field is a pseudo-algebraically closed field, which means that you don't have any division algebras over it. Therefore, since cyclic algebras uh, which are non-trivial exist, the essential dimension is exactly 2 for cyclic algebras. So for cyclic algebras, it's exactly 2. And therefore, the essential dimension of this functor is at least 2. Now, what is the problem? Any guesses? We don't have the cyclicity conjecture. Like, we have a conjecture, but it's not a fact. It is exactly 2 whenever the cyclicity conjecture holds. So it is 2. for p equals 2 or 3. Otherwise, I don't know. Okay, you see, we know very little about these things already <laughs> in the simplest case. Um, but that's life. Uh, by the way, I mentioned the essential p dimension. The essential p dimension of that thing is 2. Okay. You can use some results of Alberts from his book on the structure <coughs> of algebras to show that. 
OK, so let's uh, make a step forward. Let's consider the second easiest case of algebras of degree 4 and exponent 2, which Ellie mentioned, are always tensor products of two quaternion algebras. So let's start with the case of characteristic not to. Now, whenever I can generalize the result, I'll do it. Okay? And then you'll see when it's easy to generalize things and when it's not so easy to do it. So characteristic not to, this A can be written as alpha beta tensor gamma delta. I don't know what alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are, but there are some elements in the base field. Clearly, the essential dimension of this guy is no greater than 4. Right. How can we show that it's exactly 4? A very easy argument. You have the divided power operators, okay. which means that if you consider this thing, as Ellie mentioned, as an element in H2, then it has a well-defined map to the symbol alpha, beta, gamma, delta in H4. Now, this symbol can be non-trivial only over a field of transcendence degree at least 4 over little k, because otherwise the cohomological dimension is too small. And therefore, this, if this is non-trivial, this is non-trivial as well. And if the essential dimension of this thing is at least 4, the essential dimension of that thing is at least 4. And consequently, the essential dimension of such algebras is exactly 4. Therefore, the essential dimension of this guy is 4. Now, it's pretty easy to generalize things here. If you just take um, any tensor product of cyclic algebras in the good characteristic case, and you if, let's talk about the generic case. So you take a generic tensor product of n cyclic algebras of degree p, then using this divided power operator, you can conclude that the essential dimension of this guy is 2n, and therefore the essential dimension of this guy is at least 2n. Okay. Not exactly 2n, because not everything here decomposes in this way, but at least you get a lower bound. And it's easy to get this lower bound when the characteristic is good. Good here means not p. OK. By the way, in the literature, there are better lower bounds than this. You can look up Reichstein's work or Merkoyev's work. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about characteristic 2, which emphasizes why it's more complicated here. So now, let's start with the fact that this is a bicoterm algebra. What is the essential dimension of this guy? Is it 4? Any guesses? So it's not 4. It's actually 3. Now, there are several different arguments in the literature. I'm going to give you the easiest argument that you can find. This symbol can also be written in this way. You can add to alpha anything coming from the artin Schreier group. Okay, so you can add uh, t squared <laughs> plus t, which remains the same algebra. Now. This algebra can be modified in this following slightly more complicated way, but not way more complicated. You can see it using differential forms. So instead of gamma, you have gamma times delta plus t squared over delta, comma delta plus t squared. Now I want to end up having only three elements from the base field. So I want to 
look at this guy and this guy to make them equal. So take alpha plus t squared plus t equals delta plus t squared. Now that's a linear equation. So the essential dimension is less or equal to 3. And now you can do the same to show that the essential dimension of any tensor product of cyclic algebras of degree p in the bad characteristic case is less or equal to n plus 1 by in an inductive argument. But that's only the upper bound. What about the lower bound? So we don't have divided power operators here. Okay. You have a cup product from elements in the k group and elements in the cohomology group, two elements in the cohomology group. But that's not the same here because the cohomology group is not isomorphic to the k group in the bad characteristic. So how do we show that at least in this case, the essential dimension is actually 3? If the transcend, well, I'll just write it logically. So if the transcendence degree of E over K is less or equal to 2, then this is a C0 field, and that's at most a C2 field. Therefore, the U invariant of E is less or equal to 4. But then you don't have anisotropic Albert forms. So the moment you take a division by quaternion algebra who has a corresponding anisotropic Albert form, it cannot descend to a field of this type. So therefore, the essential dimension of division such A is exactly 3. And the essential dimension of this functor is 3. So it's different from the good case. And the lower bound is more difficult because it's ad hoc to this case. You need quadratic forms. And you have those quadratic forms only when the degree is exactly 4 and the exponent is exactly 2. The moment you switch to degree 8, you don't have Albert forms anymore. So um, what can we do? We need to come up with a different argument. And for that, I need to explain a little bit how cohomology groups look like in the bad characteristic, because they are different from those Galois cohomology groups that Eli talked about. So I'll just talk about H2 sub p of f, OK? Not the full, not the full generality, only the second cohomology group, which is isomorphic to the p torsion of the bra group. And this result is pretty old, by the way. It dates back to Teichmüller almost 100 years ago. So what is this thing? It's defined to be the co-kernel co -kernel of this map. So you take one-fold differential forms to one-fold differential forms modulo df. And the map takes any alpha over beta times d beta to alpha to the p minus alpha over beta d beta. And the isomorphism here matches this guy with the algebra alpha comma beta I mentioned earlier. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this fact is the following. If you take a field of characteristic p, the subset of p powers is a subfield, which doesn't happen in characteristic 0. And if it's a subfield, you have a, a structure of a vector space over that thing. And you can show that, oh, well, it could be infinite, but when it's finite, the dimension here is actually p to the r, where r is the p rank what we call the p-rank of this field f. Now, this p-rank increases with the transcendence degree. 
Okay, and that's the nice thing. <clears throat> and another thing that you can see here is that, well, I'm not going to rigorously show that, but it's pretty easy. So if you have f, you can write it down as f to the, well, it's a direct sum of f to the p times some beta 1 to the d1 times beta r to the dr, where those dl's range between 0 and p minus 1. So this beta 1 to beta r is the p basis of the field. And you can show that everything here can be written as f d beta 1 plus whatever to f d beta r. What does it mean about the symbol length of the second cohomology group? It's bounded from above by the p rank. OK, so where am I? Here I am. OK, so when the transcendence degree of e over k is less or equal to n, that means the p rank of E is less or equal to n, which means the symbol length, here I'm using the symbol length, Ellie. I hope you are proud of me, symbol length of H2 sub P of E is less or equal to n. And that means, what does it mean? If I take now an algebra in this category over E of degree p to the n and exponent p, its symbol length is at most n, so it decomposes. So if you start with a, an indecomposable algebra, it cannot descend to this thing. So every a here decomposes. So consequently, If A in this category is indecomposable, then its essential dimension is greater equal to n plus 1. Now, I'm going to just mention that Karpenko gave a very nice, Karpenko gave a very nice construction of indecomposable algebras in this case. So for any p and n greater or equal to 2, unless they are both actually 2, indecomposable a's um, in here exist. Yeah. Well, it can be a plural form, so A's. <coughs> and the, the construction is quite easy. To prove that they are actually indecomposable is difficult. But just to sh say what the algebras are is pretty easy. You, you start with any algebra of degree p to the n and exponent p to the n, and you extend scalars to the function field of the severed bra variety of the underlying division algebra bra equivalent to this thing to the power of p. And that's it. So they exist. And um, that's it for the results for now. Just to say what could be the next goal in this direction, So as you, s as you can see, the bad characteristic is really bad. There are certain things that are more complicated here. 
for example, for characteristic different from two, it's known that the essential dimension of algebras of degree eight and exponent two is exactly eight. It's a result of Bake and Mokoyev. I think from 2012-ish, possibly 11, I don't remember. But in characteristic two, we don't have a precise number. We just know that the essential dimension of this guy is somewhere between 4 and 10, where well, 10 is due to Bake from 2011, and this 4 is due to McKinney. It's actually the special case of the lower bound that she provided. So before that, the best lower bound was 3 that Bake came up with. So she improved it from 3 to 4. That's 20, 2011 and 17. Um, I have some feeling that uh, if you find a very good master student or PhD student, you can use Bake's computation for this 10 to somehow reduce it to 7. I haven't done it myself because I'm not a student anymore. Uh, but certainly something can be done with this 10. And I believe that this 4 is actually 5. I believe that this thing is actually 5, but I have no clue how to do it. Um, so if anybody has any idea, please let me know. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Okay, if, uh, if not, then uh, we can start going down to the coffee break and the next talk will start at uh, 4.20 p.m. Israeli time, GMT plus two.